trading futures and options on futures involves substantial risk of loss and is not suitable for all traders and investors. Oftentimes in futures trading, you have a high combination of leverage and volatility. And although this could be an equation for opportunity, it's also an equation for risk. So be careful, only fund your futures trading account with risk capital. My personal definition of risk capital is money I could afford to lose doesn't change my lifestyle or overly stress me out. As human beings, we make bad decisions when we're under stress, so be in a good spot. Remember, micro contracts could be friends. Take it easy on the day trade margins. You get plenty of leverage without maxing out on those day trade margins on a regular basis. We'll be taking a look at a real-time simulated live Ninja Trader trading platform today, and none of this should be construed as trade or investment advice. Past performance not indicative of future. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to See the Futures. My name is Jim Cagnino with Ninja Trader. It is Wednesday, November 28th, 2000. 27. Very special guest joining me live today on the show, Dan Gramza, Gramza Capital Management. Dan, good morning. Good morning, Jim. Great to be with you. But you know, one thing I noticed is that you just said 2027 and not yet. I'm so excited. I'm I'm so excited. I am so excited to have you on the show. I'm going to have a whole bunch of mental typos uh, coming through. 2023, not hey, even a 24 go. yet. Oh there my god! Go. I mean, I'm old enough. I don't need more years. <laughs> well, there you go. That's another good point. <laughs> How you been? Good, good. Thanks. Great to be with you. I'm really excited. A lot going on in the markets. What a fun day to be together, Jim. I'm, I'm looking forward to exploring some ideas with you. Yeah, and we couldn't have planned it better uh, today because you know we there's a lot of stuff going on not only in the equity markets in the in the in the interest rate markets but also the commodity markets, um, and we still have a lot of global yin and yang going on between. U.S., Europe, Asia, um, and a lot of that stuff is is a little bit contradictory coming into a post-COVID environment. True, true. Expectations aren't being met in some ways. Right. So let's talk about right away headline GDP. And this was this was the first revision, or as the Bureau of Economic Analysis calls it, uh, the second estimate. And in exceeded expectations, right? Headline was 5.2 instead of, you know, the median 5.0, which was expected. Right. Yeah. So it's doing better than, than, uh, and, and actually then what does that say to us? If we're as an economy at 5.2 and they're expecting less. Hmm. So is our economy hurt? We could think of it that way. Has, has the Fed increased so much? The interest rates at five and a half, five and a quarter to five and a half, has that had a detrimental impact on our GDP at this point? No, it's the best number we've seen since I think the third or fourth quarter of 2021. So we're seeing another indicator, I think, Jim, of resilience. Things yeah, and so be it, holding the, their own. And this is this is for last quarter, right? So right now we're at the end of November. We have the Atlanta Fed. Uh, you know, Patrick Higgins created this great you know GDP now estimate model, right? And, th and the latest estimates two point one for this quarter, right? Two point one for this quarter. That's the headline estimate as we're going in. And my question is around. What's this idea of recession? Recession seems to be a random definition of two quarters of negative GDP. Is it random or is that a real real stat? Well, it becomes real because that's the expectation. Mm. That's what the market's going to look at. And therefore, that becomes the belief. And people start reacting to that belief that, oh, my gosh, we're in a recession because of these two negative GDP numbers. So is that real? Does it have lasting impact? Not necessarily, but it is a measure that the market uses. So are we in recession environment? No, son of a gun. We've had these interest rate increases, and it seems that we're holding our own. And that creates that confidence, that comfort. And we'll see that reflected in the market itself as stock prices typically goes up as they have this increase of confidence. 
So that's interesting that, that um, you've kind of centered the conversation around investor expectation. And, you know, we saw that this morning on the opening range, the stock index futures all rallied. And then after the opening range was over, they all came back to normal. <laughs> so there were, some, there were some early expectations that were thwarted at some point uh, in the morning. I don't know what they're doing right now. Well, you figured they probably, yeah, I don't either, but they, they probably had resting orders. You know, people will wrap positions around an announcement. And so if it does this, I want the market, I want to take advantage of it. And and if it moves enough, I want to take some profit. So you have that little surge. It's not uncommon. You know, institutions that I deal with, like in Europe, for example, as they come into the U.S. time zone, they will even out positions depending on the risk manager, or they will bracket positions because nobody knows what the numbers are going to be. Yeah, and yeah. so let's try to capture some volatility on the open. And I think that's part of what you see there. What will be interesting is then how it settles out, right? Do people maintain this idea? Hey, maybe things are okay. And do we see a stronger close, which is what would be expected actually. Yeah, well, we'll keep track of it for sure, and uh, we'll, we'll we'll be live at the end of the day today and, and analyzing that in detail. But going back to um, uh, gross domestic product, we had that five point two print, and there's there's two measures, right? There's there's nominal and there's real, and let's talk about the differences between those those two measures. Um, I actually have them on my screen right now. If we could take a peek um, on oh, the yeah, left hand side, cool. and I'm. And I'm using Fred, right? This is the, I love Fred. Fred is a great, it's, 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 it's the St. Louis Fed's um, statistics database. And you could chart and you could move markers around and it's pretty cool. So on the left, I have real uh, gross domestic product. On the right, we have, I guess we'd call it nominal gross domestic product. And the real is, is simply just adjusted for inflation. Is that correct? That's right. And nominal is, it is what it is, right? It's the number that comes out of the computer. Right. So one of the interesting things is you see GDP's trajectory, you know, yeah, we had this dislocation here from COVID, right? And I'm just kind of going over to the, to the uh, nominal side. And, you know, pre-COVID high was $21.9 trillion. And then uh, current print, $27.6 trillion. So that's pretty positive GDP growth coming out of, uh, coming out of, out of COVID, right? It is. Now, when you kind of move over to the real side, we had a peak of 20, we'll round it up to 21 trillion. And, but we're only at 22.4 trillion. So the difference, my question is, is the diff, is, is this really show a keen picture of what inflation's really doing? Oh, that's a good way to say it, Jim. That's a good way to say it. Yes, I think that is what it would imply. How does inflation chew into our productivity? Which means, and here's what we want to remember, 70% of the GDP in the United States is consumer spending. So when we hear people saying, oh my gosh, it's really chewing into it. Is that real? Well, if you look at the rate of growth, if you look at the way this moves, uh, it would imply that, yeah, it has chewed in to our economy, maybe more than people realize when they look at the chart on the right. I, I so, like this, Jim. That's very clever. So, well, we, when you <laughs> consumer spending is 70 percent, I think you said. Yeah. What's the other 30 percent? Uh, well, you got 16 percent manufacturing, and that's the next largest component. And beyond that, I don't remember the breakdown, but some of those numbers have changed in terms of other sectors. But manufacturing for our country, our economy, you know, it'd be different if you're looking at Australia, New Zealand, Canada, because they're more resource based than we are. So that mix changes. But consumer spending in most countries' GDP can be significant. And in ours, it is. And, you know, that's why we look at so much 
what is that consumer? How are they feeling? What's their sentiment, which we've seen has been up? What consumer spending, which we have seen now, most recent numbers, it's up. So that also is an indicator of resiliency in our uh, economy. And that's what's so fascinating about what you're showing us is that inf is inflation having an impact? Yes, we're seeing it here. Is inflation dampening consumer spending, consumer sentiment. Not at this point. So it goes back to resiliency, which goes back to what you brought up earlier, and that is this idea of a recession. Are we in that kind of precarious environment? And the indicators are no. So, and you know, I've, there's a bunch of stats that recently came out on, you know, uh, Black Friday sales and Cyber Monday sales, which was nothing but spectacularly positive, right? Money's right. moving around. Yes. Yes. People have it and they're spending it. And, you know, Tim, here's the other thing that fascinates me is that there's still a lot of cash out there. There's a lot of cash in uh, money markets and areas like that that has not been put in to the marketplace. So do we have more juice? Do we have more fuel for the stock market sitting on the sidelines? And it looks like from the numbers that we see, the answer is yes. So it's not like, well, it's what you know, too, is that when everybody wants to buy something and they bought it, well, that's usually a top. And here, it doesn't appear we're at that point. So we still have some gas in the tank that we could go further in terms of capital that's available. So it, it's really an, a unique, interesting environment that we're in. So the great thing about inter interviewing and talking to you in general is we had a kind of a general script going in one direction and then something else popped in my head. I'm going to ask you about. <laughs> so, so bear with me here, but sure. um, so money's M2 money supply came out, I think yesterday, the day before I might, you know, with all this data coming out, I can't remember. Um, and it's, it is for the first time in since apparently 1949, where the M2 money supply is decreasing. And we saw a continuation of that decrease, right? And part of that is not only savings and checking, but money markets as well. Is, does, is that, is that going to ever make a significant dent or no? Uh, to be determined. I, I think because we haven't been in that kind of environment uh, before, or at least not for a long time. So where is the impact? And again, that M2, it's fuel to the fire. You know, if it's because when you and I think about it, first, do people have money? That's one issue. Two, are they willing to spend it? Are they willing to buy a new house? Are they willing to buy durable goods, which are things that last more than three years? Do they want to buy a new refrigerator or stove or whatever it may be if they could get by with what they have? So do we see durable goods? Do we see other uh, housing increasing or decreasing? You know, we've got a mixture of numbers on that. So what we've seen so far is that people have money and it looks like they're willing to spend it. Their attitude seems positive, although they're feeling the impact of inflation, which is not exactly what you would expect. And now you talk about M2. That's another variable in here that, hmm, where does this fit in? What does it say about what people have available to them in terms of our economy? I like right, so it it seems like it seems like the Fed's going to continue on that pathway um, at least until their reverse repo facility runs out of money. But that's a whole nother conversation. That <laughs> we let's not go down that road. Well, go ahead unless but, you got a comment but, on that. No, I was going to say that's an excellent point. 
So, you know, yesterday, which kind of drives me crazy a little bit, is we had Fed governors saying, well, we're right where we need to be. And then other ones are saying, and so we're good. And other ones are saying, like Michelle Bowman, she says, well, we're probably going to have to increase interest rates one more time. All the above is true. It, it takes six months to 18 months for our economy to feel a change in the Fed rates. So we're still in that process. I like the idea if the Fed would say, let's leave it alone now. Let's let the economy absorb what we've done. I think that is the right approach. Could they increase interest rates again? Sure. Are they at this magic 2% that they want in inflation? No. Therefore, that's a still on the table. So it shouldn't shock anyone with any of those comments. The Fed is basically saying the same thing they've said all along here. Uh, so before before we before we move internationally though, and mm -hmm. what's your opinion on you have I don't know, up, I think there's 19 dot plot members, right? Which means there's 19 uh, points of view where people are running around doing uh, press conferences, you know, for most of the period between FOMC meetings, and they're unique and different. It doesn't seem like there's a, a uniform Fed script. Is this a good thing or a bad thing just to having all these random thoughts thrown out there? It, it drives me crazy. <laughs> <laughs> it drives me crazy, Jim. I No, I don't think it's a good idea. Personally, I don't think it's a good idea. So could could the, if I'm a governor of a, a, one of the, the sections, if, if I say, well, what the hell? This is my area. This is my turf. And this is what I see. OK, you're happy to hear you talk about what's going on in manufacturing and other activity in your area. But when it comes to the Fed policy, I'd like to see a uniform script. I would say, whatever that is, we're all going to march to the same beat of the drum. The reason I feel that way is it provides a consistent message to the marketplace, good or bad. It, it just means I can lean against it. I know that, all right, we have an idea of the direction. People get upset or concerned when they don't have information. And if you have everybody saying something different, gosh, I don't know, what is the information? Well, what is it, it, that? And it gets back to investor expectations, which which we started talking about when we started. Yeah, exactly. Waller saying one thing, Bowman saying another thing, and so what's my expectation now? These are these are insiders that should know the answer. <laughs> Excellent summary. Yes. So, oh, Doc Ghana, I'd like to just see. Here's where the Fed position is, and that's what we're going to hear. And it can it change? Sure. Should it change? I don't know. That's for them to decide. But when you do, make it consistent because it creates gyrations in the market that's not necessary. So, yes, it bugs me. All right, good. I feel I feel better because I do get upset as well. But let's 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 kind of expand the conversation globally a little bit. Right. We have. We have, you know, GDP is a measure that that we use, that China uses, that Russia uses. So is uh, debt ratios between countries. Also, you know, where where are we standing with respect to some of those countries? Well, it's interesting, Jim. If you think about, well, let's start with the United States in terms of GDP. We're at twenty seven. Uh, China twenty seven trillion. China's at seventeen trillion. The euro area, which is not a country, but that eurozone, that's around fourteen trillion. Uh, Japan, the third largest economy in the world, that 4.2 trillion. Germany, 4 trillion. UK, 3 trillion. France, 2.7. Russia, 2.2 trillion. Now, you mentioned something else that's interesting. So that gives us an idea of where countries compare in terms of what they produce, right? Now, 
let's add another variable in here, and that is what you said, the debt to GDP. In other words, how much does a country owe compared to what they're producing by their GDP? Well, in the United States, we owe 29% more than we produce based on our GDP. Our debt to GDP ratio is 129. Um, if you look at China, they're at 77%. So they're, they're producing more than they owe, which makes sense when you think about the big picture there. Uh, the euro area, that's around 90%. So they're producing more out of the eurozone than they owe. Our friends in Japan, they have a very unique situation. Their debt to GDP ratio is 263. Mm -hmm. So they have a lot of debt compared to what they're producing. Um, if we think about Russia, I mentioned Russia a minute ago. Russia, uh, their debt to equity ratio is 17. So their debt is only 17% of what they produce. And they're primarily a resource-based economy. They produce stuff that they sell. Uh, you know, energy is a biggie for them. Agricultural products, diamonds, gold, all part of their economy. But their debt ratio is very small. Now, the other thing that we could think now you mentioned that Let, let's think about it from the point of view of productivity so if we're at 27 trillion not to pick on russia but to put it in perspective because we think about global powers and we think about russia in that thought process they're at 2.2 trillion dollars so we're at 25 they're at two they have 125 excuse me 145 million in their population we have 334 million so our population is twice the size so you could say well we could be more productive but from a point of view of productivity we're at 25 trillion, they're at 2 trillion. So it would seem that our productivity, not seem, our productivity is fairly high compared to what we're seeing for Russia, for example. And you could think and about and that's that. Dan, and that's Dan, I'm sorry to interrupt, but that's, that's on a uh, per capita basis is kind of how you're measuring that. Yes, yes, that's right. And, and where does and, Japan fit in that? Do you have an idea? Uh, Japan, in terms of, well, th as far as population goes, there are 124 million or okay. so, 125 million people. And they're third largest economy in the world, 4.3 trillion. So if you, their, their production is twice, mm -hmm. over twice what Russia is producing. And they have a population that's smaller than Russia. So... so at the risk of, of bringing this back to interest rates, when you have Japan with the highest ratio um, of um, a debt to GDP versus the U.S., uh, is there an advantage uh, in Japan with their interest rate structure being so much uh, uh, you know, lower interest rates than we, than we have right now with, in the latest picture? Well, that, that's a great economic debate in terms of how much debt is necessary, you know, on a personal level, on an, a company level, on a country level. And some economists would say, well, you know, a certain amount of debt isn't a problem. It's just how much is acceptable before you have a serious problem. And the issue there would be how many generations could it take for a country to pay mm -hmm. off that debt? And do they have to pay off that debt? You know, so I, I don't know the answer to that. I, I think because you can debate where this should fit in. Some people should say, you don't want any debt, you know, on a personal level. You don't want any debt, ideally. And as a country, we expect the same thing. We don't want to owe anybody money. 
And yeah. depending on how we're producing, does that does that matter? And then how much do we have to pay on that debt? I, I, just to give you a quickie, an example of that, we're at five, five and a quarter, five and a half, right, on interest rates in the United States. In Russia, it's 15%. So you think, gee, I can wow. put money there and make 15%. Can you get it out? Yeah. And, you know, what are the tax ramifications? But, yeah, yeah, yeah. you know, it's all part yeah. of that, too. Yeah, current in the currency, uh, switching over currencies. You know, the, the MMT people, modern monetary theory, you know, Stephanie Kelton and uh, are suggesting that, hey, we could just keep we just print more money. And, you know, as long as we spend it responsibly, that's the big asterisk there with the MMT people. As long as we spend it responsibly, it's okay. Cause you know, we could just print more and everything is going to be good in the long run. So I don't know if I subscribe to that, but it's an interesting theory. It is. And how it's spent is, you know, become scary when we think about Washington, but, uh, but yeah, that is a part of the thought process that debt is not necessarily an evil thing uh, yeah. on a country basis. Yeah, yeah. So, well, let, let's kind of end with, let's kind of focus on China real quick. Because we, you know, we have some markets that we look at as an example to kind of get a sense of what's happening in China. In addition to, you know, the reports coming through that, you know, they're going to continue with quantitative easing and stuff like that in 2024. And I have a copper chart up on the screen, actually, ready for you. Ah. Yeah, that this, this it, it, what an interesting, interesting marketplace, because, well, what you said, Jim, China, and this is a barometer, to me, <clears throat> of China, because China consumes about forty eight percent of the copper globally, and. And we use a lot of copper and we don't have a substitute for copper. We use it in batteries and we use it in, in the United States, 400 to 600 pounds of copper in a, in a new home, uh, 44 pounds to 99 pounds of copper in a car, depending on what you buy. An electric car would be four times that amount. So we use a lot of copper and it's unique. And what we look at in China, their economy has not bounced back as everyone thought after COVID. It really hasn't. And what we've seen is the enthusiasm they had before about the property sector, about building stuff. It, it, it's They realize maybe they overdid it a bit. And well, so and you, are, I think. When, I just want to. I just want to remind you. You told me this a long time ago. That, um, and and it and it's true that that China's had the largest migration from rural to the cities in the history of mankind. Correct. Over three hundred and fifty million people moved from the farm to the city. Holy Toledo! And you got to feed these people. You got to give them a place to stay. You know, it. It's. I always think of. It's the United States moving to Canada. That's what it is. That's that kind of shift. So it's gigantic. gigantic. They wouldn't like that, Dan. They would not like that. By oh, way. no, no. I, I think Canada would say, whoa, 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 whoa. But, so, but anyway, because of that, you have not only do you have housing needs, you have healthcare needs, you have, you have to feed people, you have to develop infrastructure and all that stuff. And if it happens too fast, things are going to break. Yeah. Yes, Jim, yes. And it's what starts out as a good thing. If, if you look at China, the evolution of their property market, they saw, wow, we build stuff. People get hired and we can employ a lot of people. We can build a lot of stuff. Look at our growth in our country. We're double digits. And that became the expectation for China. They'll have double digit growth. And then when it slowed down to single digit, whoa, wait a minute. And then after COVID, wait a minute, they're not coming back. And maybe they overdid that building, which seemed like it could go on forever. And they're tearing some of it down. But now here's what China has said. They said, you know something? 
we have a bit of a, a economy that's lagging behind what we want. So next year, we're going to put a trillion won into our economy. Copper, ho, oh, China, they're going to put a trillion in the property economy. Property economy consumes a heck of a lot of copper. Well, then this is good for copper. Copper started to move up. But have they done it? It's when you and I look at a fundamental. Is it reality? Or is it the anticipation of a future event? And this is an anticipation of a future event. They haven't put that money in there yet. It's not reality. And then we have some fundamentals driving this too. Panama, the Canadian company who owns, uh, it's First Quantum's the name of the company, if you want to look at the stock, but it's uh, it owns a, a mine in Las Bambas in um, Panama. And the government said, hey, you know that contract you, you signed? Uh, they came back and said, it's unconstitutional. So now, so does that mean they're going to nationalize that mine? Is that mine a big deal? It's 1% of global supply. In Peru, uh, I can't remember the name of the mine. Per Peru is the second largest producer of uh, copper. So we look at Peru and half of the workforce in this mine or the union, they're going on strike. So is supply tightening a bit? Possibly. Right now, Panama is offline. So could there be a tightening of supply to drive this market? Yes. Is there global demand for copper? Yes. Is China there? No. And when you hear people say, well, China consumes, they're not. They're not to the point where we really add fuel to the fire here. So oh, I, they, I'm, I'm positive on copper. It's just I'm apprehensive. Well, we're, we're, we're in overtime right now, but I have, I, have an, I have another thought I want to run by anyway. So if, if you could hang tight with me for a second. Sure. So with China and the situation they're at, and traditionally they were pretty – big purchasers of U.S. treasuries. Is it your expectation that maybe that's going to continue to be reduced and, and impact our treasury market? I wouldn't be surprised to see it reduced. But let, let's, I mean, look at Japan and China. Japan now produces, buys more of our debt than China, by the way. Although China was leading, Japan used to always lead the march, then China took over. And it's my understanding that Japan's right back again. If Let's look at China. You and I are China, the Chinese government. We sell a bunch of stuff on the global supply. And we get money for it. We get dollars for it. So we got all these dollars. What, what do we do with this stuff? I mean, where are we going to park it? I mean, we want to put it in our economy. We can support programs. We can do things with it. But... Where do we put it? Well, we should take a chunk of it and make it safe. So what country has a safe product that we can invest our money in, get a return on the money, and know they're going to pay it when it comes time? United States. So they, they, my feeling is they purchased our debt out of necessity. Not because they like the United States, Eco economic reality. And um, I could see them backing off on that, though, because they have homegrown issues they're going to need some capital for. So maybe what they would have purchased in the past, they don't buy now because they have other demands that they need that capital to stimulate their economy like the trillion won they want to put in the property market, you know? So yes, I think it could have some impact, but I think Japan's right there to pick up the slack. Awesome. Thanks so much, Dan. This whole, this whole half hour plus we spent together has been so informative. I greatly appreciate you being part of see the futures and ninja trader. 
Oh, it's my pleasure, Jim. Always great to be with you. And you always have such great ideas and insights into these markets that we explore together. I really look forward to it. So thank you for your guidance. Well, and we're going to see you again, uh, hopefully often in 2024. So I appreciate you uh, being here side by side with me this morning. Well, thank you, Jim. Again, my pleasure. All right, everybody who's watching, I greatly appreciate you being here with us today and listening to Dan. Always usually informative. He's got a great, great history and background studying these futures markets over many decades. I don't want to age him or anything like that. But I do want to remind you the most important, the most important message of the day. Please be safe out there. Be good to each other. See you soon.